Now in this chapter we're going to talk about HDR. And uh, HDR is sort of like the new rage in photography. And uh, for very good reason. Basically it expands the tonal range of an image allowing you to have like greater editing flexibility um, without degradation to your image. So what that really means is that um, in the real world we see infinite possibilities and variations of color and um, our vision adjusts to brightness in the real world. But computers can't really do that and they have to be provided with a way to see color and interpret color and all that stuff. And so one of those ways is done by giving it like a fixed bit depth or by bit information. So if we take a look at um, a little example I have here and we'll talk about LDR which is low dynamic range and HDR which is high dynamic range LDR is our typical 8-bit format or 24-bit color. So how we get that is there's 8 bits per pixel, 3 channels, the channels are RGB, so we get 8 times 3 equals 24-bit. So each RGB channel has a range of 0 to 255, or basically 256 values for each channel, and then we get our math of 256 times 256 times 256, and that's about 16.8 million colors. And uh, so any channel at any given time can display 256 shades of one color. Now, high dynamic range sort of ups the ante on that. And what it does is instead of giving it a fixed depth, like 8 bits, it uses a floating point bit depth for the three channels. And so, this is wrong, I'm going to remove that, for the RGB. And so each channel can get a range of 65,536 values. So it doesn't really change the amount of colors that you're seeing because we can only perceive a certain amount. It basically just allows the range that you can move through to be larger. What does that really mean for us? Like it means greater editing flexibility without degradation to our image. And so let's take a look at in another example of this through some gradients which will give you an idea of how these work. So I have two gradients here and they're exactly the same. The only difference is one is in 8-bit, the other one is in 16-bit. The gradient's exactly the same. So what we're going to do is apply a simple level to this in 8-bit mode, and sort of crunch our values a little bit. So you can see we've crunched it down so our gradient range is a little less. Let's do the same thing on the 16-bit one. And take a look. Now, if we zoom in, you can see that there's a greater range and it's smoother on the bottom than it is at the top. Even though they're the same gradient, the 16-bit one is smoother. And that's because there's more values and more range to work with in 16-bit mode and 32-bit mode than there is in 8-bit mode. So just some food for thought and some things to be mindful about. And so when you think about that on a larger scale of your entire image, you can see that how the values in the range um, will give you greater flexibility with higher bit depths. So how to really get HDR images? So for one, you sort of need to shoot RAW with your camera. Um, if you have an SLR, shoot RAW rather than JPEG because JPEG is an 8-bit format. If you use RAW, then RAW is a 32-bit format or 16-bit format. And that comes down to EXIF data or EXIF data. And we could take a look at an example there. I use a program called EXIF Viewer. And when you select an image or load an image, it basically gives you everything that your camera spits out when it takes a picture. It has your make, your model, orientation, the time, the date, exposure time, f-stops, ISO. Everything that, you're, that goes with your picture gets exported and embedded in your file format for RAW. That way, when Photoshop opens it, it kind of knows exactly what it's working with and uh, makes HDR possible, basically. Again, shoot RAW with your camera and use the data that comes out of your camera into Photoshop. And so we'll take a look at that using the RAW camera import next. So let's take a look at the camera RAW dialog box. File, open, and then what you're going to do is look for your RAW file format or your RAW image, which is a .cr2, and you're going to hit open. Now first let's look at our preferences. Now the camera raw preferences has the general, which is 
you can either have camera raw database as be your default or your sidecar XMP files. So when you save it, it'll save them into a .xmp or the camera raw database. You can apply sharpening to all the images you bring in here or just preview images only. Default image settings, you could apply auto tone to those if you want. Apply auto grayscale mix when converting. Make default specific to camera serial number, which again, that depends on your EXIF information. Make defaults specific to camera ISO setting. Same thing. Camera raw, so you can purge your cache here, select your location, change how much memory you want allocated to that. And then DNG, which is digital negative. You could ignore your sidecar XMP if you want, or you could update your embedded JPEG previews based off of this XMP stuff. And then your JPEG and TIFF handling. You can either disable JPEG support, automatically open all supported JPEGs, or automatically open JPEGs with settings. Same with the TIFF. That's pretty much it for the camera raw preferences. And uh, as you mess with this stuff more, you'll understand what this means. We have a couple locations for some tools. We've got the top bar, we got the right bar, and we got the bottom. And so at the top here, we have our standard zoom, and then we have our pan, or the hand tool. And then we have the white balance tool, and then your color sampler tool. And let's just go through some of these. So the white balance tool, you can sort of click and grab what you want the overall white to be in your scene. So you could click pure white if you want, or you can click another color, and you will see how it changes. Then we have our color sampler tool, which will give you RGB values for different pixels. And um, you could go ahead and select whatever you want there, and clear your samples. Here we have our parametric curves, hue, saturation, luminance. When we click on these, the sliders on the right will change to represent those luminance. And we'll get into those in a second. But then we have our crop tool. You can go ahead and crop. Or you have the straighten tool, which allows you to sort of draw a line on how you want your image to rotate or find a horizon line. So in this particular case, we could draw along here. And it's going to change our image based off of that line. Then we have our spot removal tools. Now the way that this works is you click and you drag of where you want to replace the part of your image. And you could move that, so you want to remove this line here and then you move the green circle to where you want to pull that from. And you could click and drag more than one of these things, so you can have multiple ones. So when you click off of it, you'll see that it disappears. And I'm going to do one more over here. And you could see that it's pulling pixels from wherever the green circle is going. Now obviously that doesn't make much sense there. But we could try that. And that's good enough for this. Red eye removal, we don't have any eyeballs in here to, to remove that from, but if we did have a portrait, you could go ahead and use that to remove the red eye. Then we have our adjustment brush, which on the right has some settings too. We can do exposure, brightness, contrast, and um, it's pretty cool. So if, like, if you want this highlight to be a bit brighter and to bloom a little bit, You can go ahead, adjust your exposure, and change the brightness. And you can dial it in how you want it to be. You could see, you could punch up your image a little bit just by placing these and creating an effect. 
Moving on, we have our filter, our graduated filter. And this will allow you to create a gradient that is dynamic to your image. So if we click and drag, there's our start and our end. And you could hold shift down to constrain it. And then again, with the sliders, you can dial your settings and go from there. Then you have your rotate. Then we could jump into all of our settings. Now under basic we have our white balance which we already chose our white balance using our tool so it's considering it custom. But we could change this to as shot, auto, daylight, and all the different settings there. But I'm going to go back to custom. Here you can control your temperature. So if you want to add your warmth, go ahead and do that. You can tint. You have your exposure and all your color corrections for HDR. Change your exposure then. Recovery, which helps fill in your brights with what information it can based off of your data. Fill light. The blacks or the darks that are in your image. Brightness, contrast, clarity, vibrance. And these are typical settings that you see for HDR. Then you have your tone curves. Right now we don't have any tone curves because tone curve is more about transitioning in between 8-bit and 16-bit file formats. So you can use tone curves to sort of dial it in at that aspect. Since this is raw, we're doing it to the raw image here. And then we're going to translate it into an 8-bit format. Or we can go ahead and save it out as a 16-bit format. We have sharpening control. Again, there's like the amount of sharpen, radius, all this different jazz that we can play with. But this is, we're just going over the settings here. I'm not really going to spend the time dialing this all in, but basically we have all the controls we need to sharpen our image. And uh, some noise reduction as well. Moving on, we have our grayscale. We could do convert to grayscale. And then control our colors through here. So we have like some blue here. If we do convert to grayscale and control our blues here, you're going to see that those color channels are being edited with that. So it gives you fine control over your grayscale image. Split toning. Now you can split tone your highlights and your shadows. But if you grab the hue, you're not going to see anything change in this right away. Since your saturation is all the way down, you need to bring this up. And then you'll start see, seeing your saturation and then you could dial in your hue. Same with your shadows, you gotta bring the saturation up and then dial in your hue. We have lens correction. Now, you can see that when I have this clicked on, because of my EXIF data, it knows what kind of camera I have and it automatically adjusts for the lens correction or the lens distortion. And then you could do this manually as well. And we'll show this another example of this later. But right now we're just going to move on. Then you have your effects. We have grain. If you want this image to be super grainy, you can control the amount of grain, size of your grain, roughness etc. And again, this is kind of up to you to mix and match what you want. And then different priorities for vignetting. And you can see what that does. Camera calibration. These are just According to your camera profile, you can adjust to some different ones here. Camera Faithful, Adobe Standard, and again, more control over color, your primaries, and moving on.
Now presets, we could go ahead and make this a preset. We could save this and apply this these settings to other things. And we could apply this to auto tone adjustments as well. So if we hit save, it's going to save out an XMP that we can load up and use on other images. And then with a snapshot, we could go ahead, take a new snapshot. We could say Chicago Bean. And it's going to take that snapshot. So if we go ahead and revert, we could say Camera Raw Defaults. It went back to our original state. And there's our snapshot with our settings. Or presets. And load up the presets there too. And then at the end of the day, when we're all done, we can hit Done. And that's going to apply changes um, into Smith's dialog without opening an image. So it's going to take these changes and just sort of keep them as settings, but not actually open the image or apply the image. If we hit Open Image, it's going to convert it to 8 bit. And there we have our settings from the Camera Raw dialog box. So let's take a look at HDR toning. You can go to Image, Adjust, HDR toning. Brings up our dialog box of all of our controls for HDR toning. So the methods we have is Local Adaption, Exposure and Gamma, Highlight Compression, Equalize Histogram. Local Adaption is um, sort of where all your bells and whistles are for giving you fine-tuned control over your image. Now let's look at Exposure and Gamma really quick, which gives you manual control over your exposure and your gamma. Now Highlight Compression is automatic. And what it does is sort of compress your highlight values so they sort of fall in within an 8-bit range. And uh, again, it's automatic and you don't really have to do anything for this. Um, so let's move on to Equalize Histogram. And what that is doing is compressing the range while trying to preserve some contrast in your image. So let's go back to Local Adaption. So our Edge Glow basically controls the brightness in the areas like with the largest areas of contrast in your image. So you can see that we're getting that edge glow now. Tone and detail, you have your gamma. You have your detail, which is the amount of detail in your image. So you can go from basically nothing or very little to crazy amounts. And so when you start looking at something like this, you can see that um, it's sort of reminiscent of some of the HDR imaging that you've seen, and that's one of the controls for that. So we're going to take that down, though. Then we have our shadow. Obviously controls your shadow and your darks. And then you have your highlights, which in this particular image are high highlights are in the clouds. You have your vibrance for your color. You have craziness or in between. You have your saturation or in between. And then you have your curve and histogram which works like Photoshop curves. You can kind of push and pull where you want details based off of a curve. and go from there. And that's pretty much the HDR toning dialog box. And let's hit OK. And then it's going to convert our image with those settings and open it in Photoshop for further editing. Now let's take a look at lens correction. And so if we go ahead and open an image, I'm going to open a raw image. And it's going to open up our camera raw dialog box again. So in our tab, we have the lens correction, and it says enable lens profile corrections. Now because my EXIF data has already been plugged in, and it's aware of the camera that I have, like it automatically turns it on and automatically corrects it. So you can see here, this is with it off. I turn it on, 
and there it is. And so under the profile it has your make, your model, or your lens, and then the profile, and there's your correction amount. And you could go ahead and adjust it more if you feel the need or if you'd like to. But let's take a look at an example if it's just from a JPEG and you don't have EXIF data. So I'm going to cancel this. I'm going to go ahead and open a JPEG. It's actually a PSD based off of a JPEG. And here we have to go to Filter, Lens Correction. So it sort of brings up the same dialog box. It's not the camera raw dialog box, but it's very similar. And we have remove distortion tool, and we got the straighten tool, move grid tool, hand tool, zoom tool. And then on the right we have our auto correction and then our custom. So here we don't have the EXIF data that we could plug into, so we have to do this manually. So one thing we're going to try to do is straighten this image. You can see that it's off a little bit. So I'm going to use our straighten tool and I'm going to draw where I want this to be straight. It's along this line here. You can see that, there we go, it got straightened. Now there is some raw profile here in match image sensor size for your camera. And one thing we could do is use the search criteria here to try and make it auto-correct it for us. Now, it already has our Canon in here. As for our model, we can do maybe the Rebel one, because I do have a Rebel, but it's older. Or we could do Canon here, and then look again. So it's not exactly on there, but you could see the difference a little bit. But it looks like we're going to have to do some manual labor on this one. So if we go to Custom, we can do Remove Distortion, which is a barrel distortion from the lens. So we probably want to like kind of suck the image in towards its center, like this. Which that seemed to do a pretty good job. And you could go extremes with this. You could go, you know, you could correct fish eyes with it, or totally do corner pins that are crazy too. But it looked like around here was pretty good. We could toggle our preview. So you can see that's what it was. This is what it is now. So we kind of removed our distortion. Let's look at our chromatic aberration. And this image doesn't look like it has too much of that, but this is where you would control that. Your vignette. That's how you can reduce some of your vignette, or add it in if you'd like. You can change your midpoint, which you have to have more vignette to see your midpoint, which is kind of your fade and your range. And then your transform, you have vertical perspective, and your horizontal perspective, to sort of help correct that too and then even your angle and your scale. So there's a lot of different options here for correcting your lens and perspective and some issues that you have with your image. So if we click on our preview, you can see where we started from. It had some distortion, it's on an angle, some vignette stuff, and uh, we pushed it into this. But that's pretty much a lens correction. If you're using a RAW photo, the Camera RAW Editing dialog box will open, and that's where you do your lens correction in there. You could still access it at any time, but when you're using a JPEG, you have to do it manually by going to Filter, Lens Correction. And you can see here is our applied new filter. Looks a little bit better. Of course, we can undo that and see our differences, and we're done. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about the Merge to HDR Pro, and that starts by having a series of images that are bracketed
from your camera. And by bracketing I mean that you could take multiple exposures of the same image and then merge them together in Photoshop to push and pull your dynamic range of values and pixels to get one final image. So in this particular case, I'm only displaying three exposures right here, but we can have five, you can have ten, um, and we could load those into Photoshop and then we could edit them. So again, bracketing, you set up your camera to take multiple exposures of the same image and um, it's pretty important to also use a tripod or something to keep your image stable because since you're using multiple pictures you need them to be all exactly the same um, and so let's take a look at that. So to merge you need to go to File, Automate, Merge to HDR Pro and what you do is select your files so you go to Browse and I'm going to use my example here to three, four, five images and hit open. Also it's important to check this attempt to automatically align source images which means that Photoshop's going to try and do some magic to keep all your images aligned and uh, then hit OK. Now once you're in the merged HDR Pro you can see that at the bottom we have our five exposures and then on a right at the top we have some presets. Now these are presets that Photoshop gives you to sort of um, start off, you can kind of dial with them a little bit and see if some of them works to your liking. Um, the edge glow allows you to control the glows between the exposures or the bright pixels between the exposures. And here I'm just going to try and dial in this image based off these five exposures to make like a nice looking glow but enough contrast and enough detail to keep image interesting. In the tone and detail you have gamma, exposure, detail, shadow, and highlight with sliders and so I'm adjusting the gamma to kind of get some nice contrast between the glow and the darks that are in the image. Now, oops, I forgot to put on re Remove Ghosts. Remove Ghosts basically sort of helps align your images a little bit more so if your pictures are off a little bit um, it will sort of do some magic under the hood to kind of remove the ghosting and to keep your image clear. You can also turn off some of the images if they're not contributing what you want in your final image. So you can go ahead and turn those off. Again, in the tone and detail, pushing and pulling the highlights, the detail, and the gamma to try and get the effect that we're looking for. I'm going to save this preset that way it's available for other images. I'm going to hit OK. So in this part I'm going to do a lens blur on this. So I'm using a soft selection or a quick mask to make a selection around there. I'm going to go to Filter, Lens Blur, and I'm going to switch my source to None which is using my selection because I don't have a mask for this. I'm going to change my radius. You can see it's blurring, but then I want to invert it, invert my selection, and change my radius to sort of help create a, like a fake lens blur on this to keep all the detail focused. And we'll hit OK. And there's our final image. And what we're going to do is remove this flare here. Let's just make a selection using our lasso tool. Draw around this and then use our content aware fill and there we go.